Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this history program. Today we begin a new series with J.B. Anderson. It's called The History of Psychology, and today's topic is Stanley Milgram and his infamous experiment. J.B. Anderson is an educator, curator, historian, and writer. He is the creator of the popular President series that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota and the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson, on Stanley Milgram and his infamous experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Uh, audience, it's going to take me just a few seconds here to get my screen set up. Stanley Milgram had a short life, uh, died at 51 years and eight months, lived from uh, 1933 to 1984. Uh, he died of a heart attack. Uh, he was working in New York City at the time, teaching there. And it was his fifth heart attack, so he'd had heart trouble for some time. Uh, let's first talk about Milgram and uh, his life a bit. He was a social psychologist. Uh, <clears throat> next few slides will talk about what are social psychologists and what they do. He uh, received his doctoral degree from Harvard, 1960 and then uh, spent the next uh, 25 years to his death teaching at uh, Yale, uh, Harvard, and the City University of New York, which is in Manhattan, and it's uh, taught at the graduate school there. Uh, so what's social psychology? That was Milgram's field. <clears throat> Everybody has <clears throat> thoughts about themselves, other people. We all have feelings. Uh, and we look at how other people behave. Uh, we're influenced by what we are perceiving. What are they doing? Golly, how are, what are, I, I'm imagining this person doesn't like me. Or, uh, gee, this person sitting real close, I think we're really establishing a relationship here, so on. This is called perception. And uh, in psychology, that's very important. That's far more important than the facts of the situation or the reality of the situation. It's all about how you perceive it, uh, what you think is happening in um, person-to-person -person communication. So social psychology basically in six words is, it is you in the group. Uh, this is uh, Gordon Elport. Now uh, Milgram uh, studied under Gordon Elport. Uh, so I'm gonna do a slide here on Elport and many of you may have heard of him. He's pretty famous in psychology. And he's famous for the Alport Vernon Lindsay study of values. Many people, uh, uh, when they were in college, had to take this test. And so you may already have heard of it. Uh, they, they make uh, people out to be one of six, fall into one of six different categories. You're a theoretical person, an economic person, uh, et cetera. You might be a religious person. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just, uh, more than anything, wanted to make the association between Elport and Milgram. Take a look at Stanley Milgram's life. He was a Jew and uh, grew up in New York City. New York City has five boroughs. Way to the south off of this map is Staten Island. Then as we come northward, you can see there's Brooklyn, Queens, and Bronx. 
And spanning all of those is the island of Manhattan, the most famous of the five boroughs. So uh, uh, Milgram grew up in the Bronx. I've been to Manhattan many times. I, I don't know how many, somewhere between 12 and 20. -ish. And uh, only been out of Manhattan once. There's so much to do in Manhattan, but I went up to the Bronx Botanical Garden. Uh, his parents were immigrants and they came to the United States as a result of World War I, which was very disruptive throughout Europe. And his parents were from the two countries you see here with the black arrows, Romania and Hungary. And uh, you can see uh, Romania and Hungary both have a common border with Ukraine, which of course is a major news item nowadays. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, I have a yellow arrow there at Macedonia, just as a kind of a side story. <laughs> it has been a part of Greece for thousands of years. And I was a, at a party like back in the 70s, and there was a woman there talking about Macedonia and how they need independence and so on. And her ancestors are from Macedonia. And I said, golly, it's been, that's where Alexander the Great is from. It's been a part of Greece for couple thousand years and just saying that uh, this woman got emotional so we shut up about it but today it is now a separate and independent country. <clears throat> uh, Milgram's father was a baker uh, in the Bronx and uh, his father died young uh, again bad heart his mother took over the business, so they were able to survive nicely uh, with the business intact. Uh, relatives of uh, Milgrams started coming to the United States after World War II, and uh, in the process of finding a place to live, they would stay with, with the Milgram household, and uh, Stanley Milgram got in touch with some relatives who were survivors of the Holocaust as a result. And they bore the tattoos, such as you see here. I had a, a young student once who had a tattoo like this on his arm. And I said, that's a, but that's a Nazi concentration camp tattoo is what it looks like. He said, you're the first person to say that. Most people ask me, what are those numbers? And he told me that his grandfather was a survivor and he had an exact copy of his grandfather's tattoo placed on his own arm. Uh, Milgram uh, was bar mitzvahed, uh, a Jewish practice uh, coming to adulthood. And you make a speech at your bar mitzvah. Uh, here is uh, <clears throat> Milgram's speech. As I find happiness in joining the ranks of Israel, the knowledge of the tragic suffering of my fellow Jews makes this an occasion to reflect upon the heritage of my people, which now becomes mine. I shall try to understand my people and do my best to share the responsibilities which history has placed upon us. Uh, he wrote as an adult to a friend, I should have been born into a German-speaking Jewish community of Prague and died in a gas chamber some years later. How I came to be born in the Bronx Hospital, I'll never quite understand. Uh, frequently, there uh, is guilt among Jewish people who luckily escaped. Um, also, it should be said that uh, the 6 million Jews who died in concentration camps, you can add to that 6 million non-Jews who also died in concentration camps, included a lot of union leaders, many college professors, gypsies, people who were seen as, um, uh, you know, not up to the standards of uh, being human beings. Uh, many were at half. Uh, were non-Jews. 
Milgram did uh, some obedience research uh, and uh, it received a good bit of criticism. That obedience research, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, deals with um, how do people respond to authority figures? Uh, well, I told you to do this. Okay, I'll go ahead and do it then. Uh, so this research on obedience grew out of his uh, concerns about the Holocaust and his personal connections with it. Uh, this is the woman that uh, Milgram married, Alexandra, went by the name Sasha Menken. Uh, they had two children, Michelle and Mark. Uh, again, Milgram died at the age of 51. Father died at the age of 55, same problem, heart attacks. Uh, the first uh, piece of research that we're going to talk about Milgram called small world phenomenon, but it's known popularly as six degrees of separation. Uh, it was uh, done in 1967, and he, he tracked uh, chains of acquaintances. Uh, people would put their name on a sheet of paper and it'd be mailed around and uh, pretty soon somebody would say, I know somebody on this sheet. Now he did this research within the United States only. It was not done worldwide. Uh, he picked the town of Omaha, Nebraska, and he sent a letter to 160 people. And he simply said, I want you to place your name on this letter and then mail it back to me. So he had a list inside the envelope. Uh, you'd write your name on it, send it back to him. He'd send it out again to people in Omaha. Now, each, um, uh, uh, each uh, letter uh, was sent to a random person. Then he'd, when he got them back, he'd send them out to another separate group of random people. When a person in Omaha recognized a name on the list, it might even be just the second person on the list. You wrote your name on it, mailed it back to Milgram. He mailed it out to people in Omaha. Second person might say, hey, I know this first person. You'd write back to uh, Milgram using a postcard such as you see here. That would stop that, uh, that letter from going out again. Then again, he might uh, have mailed it to 10 different people and the 10th person will say, hey, I know the fourth person. <clears throat> so then the postcard would get mailed back to Milgram. The results uh, were startling to Milgram. He had his first uh, identification in just four days with the second mailing that he put out. Uh, and uh, there were two people who knew each other on the list. Uh, the range of numbers before a person knew another person was from two very early uh, up to 10 as a max. Uh, people averaged five. So there would be five names on uh, or six names on the list uh, before a person recognized uh, another person. Uh, so that's uh, six degrees of separation. A lot of people uh, questioned this research. They didn't think it could be accurate. A major critic was this woman here. These are two pictures of her different stages of life. Elizabeth Davido Rayburn. Uh, and she was a major critic of the research. Some of it is a small area. Omaha, Nebraska, a small group, only 160 people. Uh, other people repeated the research and, and got the same results, but we're using small groups again. Finally, 2008, this is under um, uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, the big corporation uh, approved by their director and uh, this is 41 years after Milgram's research. 
and uh, Microsoft did this and they, they used a messaging service that they had developed and uh, they used thousands of participants. Their results were 6.6 .6 degrees of separation and uh, they used a much larger area also. So it's amazing that uh, within about six to seven people, uh, you can find somebody in some cases worldwide who uh, know each other. There's another way to talk about this research. You got 3000 letters, you send them out to random people. Uh, you, uh, the person that gets the letter puts their name at the top of the list, mails it back to the researcher. The letters are mailed out again randomly. Uh, these 3000 letters to a much larger audience and a much larger area. Place your name at the top of the list, mail it back to the researcher. On average, with the research, the variety of researchers that had been done, it was during this sixth mailing that the average person knew somebody else on the list. Another piece of research by Milgram, known as the lost letter experiment. Uh, how helpful are you to strangers is what this is about. Uh, and in reality, it's measuring prejudice against uh, uh, certain groups or favorability to other groups. Uh, envelopes would be addressed. Now, in some cases, they were simply addressed to an individual. So it was a person's name on the envelope. In other cases, uh, the envelope was addressed <clears throat> to a medical group, a clinic, a hospital, something like that. Those are groups that most people look upon as favorable. Oh, this is a letter to somebody's friend. Or, oh, oh this is uh, some kind of medical information. I need to remail this again. Then there were stigmatized groups. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the letters were mailed to uh, or addressed to the Nazi party of the United States or the communist party. <clears throat> now these letters, because the title is lost letter, that's precisely what happened with these letters. The um, person doing the research would go out and simply leave these letters in random places. They'd drop them on the sidewalk people walking along and see a letter on the sidewalk. They'd put them under the wiper blade of a car. They'd put them in a telephone booth. I showed you how old the uh, research is since telephone booths just don't even exist anymore. Or they'd go into a shop. They might be looking at a pile of shirts on a cabinet and they would uh, leave the letter with the pile of shirts. So they, somebody would come in looking at shirts and they go, oh, somebody left a letter here. Now, <clears throat> person finding the letter, they could mail it, they could ignore it, just leave it lay there, or, or they could destroy it, throw it out. So let's take a look at what happened. Uh, letters addressed to medical groups, 72% of them were mailed. Now, the return address on all of these was to Stanley Milgram. Didn't have his name on it, but it had his address on it. So he's getting all of these letters that are mailed back. All of the ones that said medical groups, 72% were returned. All that had just the name of an individual was, so it looked like a personal letter, 71% were returned. Letters that he lost addressed to the Nazi party, only 25% were returned. Assumption is the other 75% were destroyed. Same with the Communist Party, 25% were returned. So there's a significant difference between favorable looking letters and stigmatized looking letters. Now, letters that had been opened. Some letters had been opened and then scotch taped shut again or, or resealed somehow. Uh, 
For medical groups, 25% had been open. 10% uh, of those addressed to an individual had been opened. Nazi party letters, 32%. Communist party letters, 40%. Uh, what's interesting about this is a personal letter, well, I'll, I'll just mail it. But medical groups and the two stigmatized parties, you know, a person could be thinking, hmm, this could be a payment to the medical group, or this could be a donation to one of these political parties. Maybe there's money in here. The analysis of the study came down to that uh, uh, there is prejudice against certain groups and uh, individuals uh, reacting to those groups display that prejudice. Uh, also, the study involved an everyday task. You find the letter, there's mailboxes all around the place. You can just simply mail it. You can take it home, put it in your own mailbox. It'll be picked up. So it's something that everybody knew how to do. And there was an easy uh, way to resolve the issue of finding a letter and getting it remailed. People did not realize they were being studied. Uh, they just simply found a letter someplace. Now that makes the study more valid. You don't go into a room at some university and you're seated and ask questions and, and you know you're being studied. This is not knowing that you're being studied. Uh, these kinds of studies are called unobtrusive studies. Uh, that's people just, they don't know that this is what's happening. I have a friend who did his PhD thesis study in the 1960s, and he was uh, in uh, Mexico, and his field was Latin American politics. Now, he could walk in to a Mexican village and it might have uh, 300 houses, and he could walk the streets there and he could count the number of TV antennas. So he could leave that town and say, uh, well, one third of the people in this village have television sets. And that would tell him who's getting communication of some sort uh, electronically. Nobody knew they were being studied. You're simply walking the town and counting television antennas. Another thing he did was in larger towns with manufacturing companies, on a Monday morning, he would sit outside the company and watch workers arrive. Now in Mexico, people living in cities wore different style hats than people in rural areas did. When I, when I was a student at the University of Minnesota in the early 1960s, we could tell in a second if a person was from rural Minnesota or not. Uh, that's all changed. Everybody looks the same now, watching the same TV shows, uh, so on and so forth. Anyway, he would sit outside this manufacturing company and uh, he would count the number of rural hats that would walk in. And he would say, okay, over the weekend, these people moved in and, and they had gotten a job at this manufacturing plant. Uh, by the end of the week, Friday, he'd sit out there again and he wouldn't see any, ha any rural hats. <clears throat> Everybody who had had a rural hat on Monday had adapted to the city lifestyle. So he could see uh, how many people yeah, are coming in from a different... Uh, uh, part of Mexico. Um, pretty much talked about this slide. Uh, this kind of analysis has been used in politics in the United States. Uh, um, the uh, Johnson Goldwater campaign started it, that was 1964. And today it's a widely used uh, technique uh, and it's, uh, you know, how many Democrats 
uh, letters get mailed, how many Republican letters get mailed, and it's a way of tracing how people might vote in certain areas. Uh, be interesting today to do a piece of research like this with letters and have them addressed to churches, synagogues, mosques, Buddhist temples, uh, based on religion, see uh, how many do Christian churches get more letters remailed than do Jewish synagogues, for instance, etc. <clears throat> Also, it'd be interesting to know what parts of town uh, these letters are left in. Are they left randomly throughout towns, uh, uh, wealthier areas, shopping areas, poor areas? Are they left at events like baseball games, for instance? <clears throat> Rather, there's a difference between letters left at baseball games versus letters uh, left in a department store. Uh, now we're going to talk about the obedience research uh, that is probably the most famous of Milgram's studies. Uh, this was a, a study <clears throat> that was published in 1963. It's called The Behavioral Study of Obedience, and it was first published in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology. But later on, 11 years later, it had become such a well-discussed uh, piece of research that uh, Milgram put out a book on the topic uh, titled Obedience to Authority. Uh, here is a setup of what the research uh, uh, geography looked like. You had an experimenter, top right, that's usually the professor that's conducting the research. They greet the subject that uh, could be a student, uh, could be people they've called in from the community, and they're sitting in the same room. Now, down the hall on your, and this is a room on your left there, there's a subject who, uh, and it's a fake test subject. And uh, that's a person who's in, a cohort to the college professor, maybe one of his graduate students. Okay, what do they do? The subject enters the laboratory. They're told that they're going to be involved in a piece of research where they're going to be asked questions. And um, we're going to see what your knowledge is. I'll, uh, you know, answer the question. We'll determine if it's the correct or incorrect response. And we'll also give you a list of numbers and we'll ask you to repeat them in the same order. Uh, we'll be checking your memory. Uh, I'm your teacher, uh, so let's sit down here and uh, let's get started. And uh, they also did word associations, you know, they'd give you a word and you'd have to respond with a word. And the subject in the adjacent room was the collaborator on the experiment. Now, the person that was told to ask a question of the subject had a panel of buttons in front of them. So you're gonna ask this person down the hall a question. If they get that question incorrect, you're to press button number one. That'll give them a little electrical shock. And we hope that'll make them uh, respond better in the future. You ask them a second question. If they get that wrong, you press the second button. They get a little larger shock. So the shock levels will increase as they get uh, questions incorrectly answered. And uh, by the time you get to that fifth button, uh, that's a pretty dangerous charge. Uh, uh, and the, by the way, the uh, person that you're talking to and asking these questions of down the hall through a microphone, and you can hear them through the loudspeaker in this room, uh, that person is strapped in a chair. They can't get up and leave. So let's see what happened. Well, uh, 
as the person down the hall who's being asked the questions gets greater shock, they start, oh, stop this, I can't stand it. I get, untie me from this chair. And they scream uh, as the shock level increases. Now the experimenter, the professor who's running the whole show, tells the subject sitting in the same room with him, no, it's okay, keep going. It's, it, uh, I, I, we, we need to figure this uh, research out. Uh, it's not as threatening as it sounds like to you, uh, and it's okay, go ahead, keep doing it. So here again is a picture of the situation. The professor back there has given questions to the subject to ask them of the collaborator down the hall. And uh, you, hit, uh, you hit a button to increase the shock level. 65% of all subjects who were asking the questions and pushing the buttons, administering the shocks to the highest level did exactly that. So almost two thirds of all people took the person they were asking questions of to the worst level of shocking. Uh, repeats had been done uh, on this obedience research. Uh, results varied a bit uh, based on what the experimenter said, but the 65% rate held pretty well. Uh, sometimes they'd be told, uh, uh, or different subjects would be told different things. When they were told, hey, this is for the good of science, that the highest shocking levels were obtained when that phrase was used. Uh, Milgram's analysis. Uh, the subject uh, who's asking the questions and administering the shocks is simply doing what someone else is telling them to do. They're carrying out someone else's wishes. They're not responsible and they can tell themselves that. I'm not responsible. Somebody else is telling me to do this. So a shift has occurred from me being a person uh, with uh, control in this situation to me simply being an intermediary having to do what someone else is instructing me to do. So you see yourself as an instrument of another person and responsibility is transferred to the other person. It's not me that's involved. Other factors in the obedience, uh, according to Milgram was uh, people wanna be polite. There's a guy sitting in a room telling you it's okay. And you're going to tell him, no, no, it's not. You know, uh, that, that's being kind of nasty. A second thing is uh, walking out of here would be awkward. Um, that'd be strange. I'd be seen as a quitter. And uh, a lot of people got to uh, just, uh, gee, I'm real interested in this and these buttons. And the technical aspects of this whole piece of research, um, and so they really got uh, they really got involved. Fourth, became impersonal. It's no longer about humanity. It's no longer about being a human being. It's about carrying out the wishes of someone else. And we're learning from this. Uh, this is a desirable thing. Uh, people will know something when it's over. It's also very sequential, and people like to see things sequentially, uh, according to Milgram. Uh, you go from button one to button two to button three. You ask a series of questions as you move along. And... Um, Milgram said anxiety uh, becomes part of the issue. 
uh, and uh, the anxiety makes you continue because hopefully this will all stop pretty soon. Uh, other people analyze this and uh, use the term uh, belief of uh, perseverance. Uh, people cannot see that someone sitting in the same room with them who greeted them, shook their hand, explained very nicely to them what the experiment was going to be about. This is a nice person. Reality is, this is a very malevolent person. This is somebody who's mean and cruel. Um, so even when confronted with the evidence of somebody down the hall starting to scream at the shocks you're administering, you're still going, yeah, but that, that's a nice guy I'm with in this room. Analysis of other experts concerning this research, which became a very controversial piece of research, uh, should it even ever have been done. Uh, the subjects, the people administering the shocks sensed that, uh, well, uh, this just isn't real. I mean, I'm not seeing anything here. The, so the lack of reality sets in. And You've been invited into a laboratory situation. This is kind of make-believe, isn't it? I mean, this isn't real. Uh, the uh, other people uh, said um, it's unethical research. It's something that never should have been done to begin with. It's making people torture other people. You don't do that. Uh, Milgram's Jewish background is what set him uh, on the track of doing this obedience research. Uh, and some critics said Milgram is uh, too personally involved in this research. He's doing it uh, because of something in his own background. Uh, the Sage Publication Journal uh, and they came out uh, uh, with some interesting uh, analysis on uh, Milgram's obedience research. Uh, they, they said um, the participants, the people that were pressing the buttons and shocking the person down the hall, were visibly distressed. So this was not something that they were enjoying. There were even some participants who began to tremble, some who were sweating, some who would laugh nervously. Uh, you could see lip biting among them. These are people that are, were not comfortable doing this. Uh, signs of stress were displayed. They were digging fingernails into their palms like this, and uh, uh, how can I get out of this and camp? And, so the right to withdrawal, a total of three participants did stand up and leave, walk out, uh, and uh, had uncontrollable seizures. They started shaking. And so it was an ethical issue. Uh, and uh, uh, was the right to withdraw ever instilled in them? Uh, there were a total of uh, 40 participants. 7.5% uh, had seizures. All the participants were males, and they were paid uh, $4.50 an hour in 1963 when the minimum wage was about a buck an hour. Uh, the, part of the criticism here is this is a small research sample, only 40 people. Uh, Milgram responds to the critics. Uh, basically, the people that are criticizing the research don't like the results that it showed. Uh, they don't like the fact that we have to admit that two -third, nearly two-thirds of us are, uh, are going to shock a person uh, to a horrible level. Uh, and the whole assumption that when something is very negative, people will simply turn their back on it 
Yeah, okay, this is somebody else's doing. Uh, research, uh, another thing that uh, Milgram responded to was police interrogations. And the research had been used to show that uh, police could get innocent people to confess to crimes. So all of a sudden it's an attack on police, which wasn't the case but it certainly means that police interrogation could be changed. I taught psychology for 15 years. 10 of those years, I had a section of criminology. Uh, had a guy come in who trained all police officers on interrogation techniques throughout the state of Minnesota. He said, give me a room with nothing in it but a table and a chair, nothing on the walls, and 10 hours with a subject, I'll have them confessing to anything. Uh, so the condition of the room can make a difference. Uh, police have chairs in a room. Uh, the chair that the police sit in is on rollers and they can move around. The police that the subject, or the, the uh, room that, where the subject is seated with the police, that chair, is screwed down to the floor so the subject can't move. Uh, many people confess to things that they didn't do. In the late 1940s, the FBI quit accepting confessions. They frequently had 10 people would come in and confess to the same crime. They'd get multiple confessions. Uh, David Raver, is a person who also analyzed uh, Milgram's uh, work. Uh, and he said, um, uh, the, the personal interests of the subjects were, was diverse. Uh, and that's interesting because uh, you can get a wide variety of differing approaches from people who still will shock to the maximum level. <clears throat> he also said the contribution of this research was monumental. It really it showed us who we are and how we need to be aware of ourselves. And he also said the research helped justify things that many people dismiss. That's unethical. It's immoral. Uh, that would never happen. I would never do such a thing, etc. People just simply dismiss themselves as being capable of such things. And uh, the fact is, uh, a vast majority are capable. Uh, Raver also said that uh, this kind of research uh, contributed greatly to the understanding of uh, people as human beings and what kind of humanity we do indeed display. And uh, and uh, the final argument Raver made was, um, or another argument he made was uh, a better treatment of researchers. Uh, stop being critical just because you don't like what the results are or you don't like the nature of the research. So let's look at the continuing controversy of the research. Uh, he did this research when he was a professor at Harvard. Uh, after four years of being at Harvard and the research getting published and being um, heavily criticized, he was fired from his job at Harvard. American Psychological Association, which psychologists can become a member of, you have to apply. He applied uh, right at the height of this research controversy, and his application was sat on for a year uh, and then was finally approved. Usually they were approved within a few days of receiving them. In uh, 1964, he won the uh, uh, award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And they named his research on obedience as being the reason for the reward or award. I wonder uh, what would happen if they'd have used uh, women as subjects. He only had 40 subjects, they were all men. Would there be any differences? 
Uh, and there can be some doubt about whether there'd be differences or not, even though research hasn't been done. Uh, women were executed in Nazi gas chambers, and women who worked in the gas chambers were part of the same process, but it uh, be an interesting question, see if there's value differences based on gender. Uh, Antisocial behavior. Uh, there's been uh, lots of criticism of young people all throughout history. This is, a, this is another piece of research now. Uh, you know, back when I was a kid, uh, TV's ruining your life. You're watching too much TV. We're going to limit you to an hour a day, so on and so forth. Amazingly, I never heard that from my parents. We were allowed to watch TV, but uh, I had lots of friends who had TV limited. Uh, TV causes people, especially children, to stay at home. They aren't out in the neighborhood anymore. They aren't necessarily uh, playing with a broader group of people like they would be if they weren't uh, in their own home looking at a TV set. And when you look at a TV set, you don't talk to other people. Uh, this isn't Milgram research, but research was done when TV started about um, what happens to people watching TV as opposed to going to movies, which had been the big operation uh, before TV, the big entertainment thing. Uh, one thing is people get dressed up. They'd go to the movie. You had to go out to do it. Uh, they'd go as a total family. They'd sit and watch the movie. Afterwards, on, they might go out to have something to eat and talk about the movie they saw, or they'd go home and talk about it. Now, you got different kinds of things on TV. The adults like to watch Lawrence Welk. The kids don't like that kind of music. The families aren't doing it together anymore. Uh, there's no talking to each other after a TV show like there is or was after a movie, et cetera. Uh, 1970-71 uh, is when this uh, research was done. Milgram would have people watch TV shows, and uh, some of them would have a violent ending, such as displayed in the graphic here. Others would have a nice ending. People were then asked um, to steal money, donate money, or do neither. And Milgram found that viewers watching a movie that had violence at the end of it were no longer, uh, no more likely to say, I'm going to steal the money or I'm going to donate the money. Or there, there really was no difference between the content of the TV show or, uh, and uh, how people responded afterwards to being given an option of uh, antisocial versus uh, social behavior. Telephones are ruining teenagers. Radio is ruining teenagers. Uh, cell phones are ruining teenagers. I get your cell phone eight hours a day. You can have it the rest of the day. Uh, so, um, I, my mother was from Canada. She grew up on a farm. She could go to a local school, a one-room schoolhouse in Canada through the eighth grade. Well, her parents believed in an education, so she was sent into town where they had a high school, and she lived with a family in town for her high school years. She was a very good student through the eighth grade. In high school, she went from A's to C's. Why? The family in the town had a telephone. So uh, that's a small case example of how a telephone ruined somebody. My mother was spending time on the telephone. 
And uh, of course, that doesn't doesn't prove any points. It's just an interesting personal story. By the way, my mother uh, had got this high school card, uh, report card, and it was full of C's, and she'd been used to getting A's. She didn't want her parents to see it when she'd go home for a weekend. So she found a little whole place in this uh, family that she was living with in the wall and she stuffed her report card through the little hole in the wall. And uh, it was about 50 years later, they were tearing the house down. And one of the guys tearing the house down found my mother's report card. And he said, I know a guy, this, this woman is his aunt, uh, and the guy was my cousin. So he took my mother's report card to my cousin in a nearby town. Uh, and uh, interesting story anyway, but um, certainly a telephone kind of ruined my mother. But uh, generally speaking, uh, people have ended up being okay with devices. Uh, youth is easily deceived. They overdo everything. Aristotle said that 2,400 years ago, and we've been laying it on teenagers ever since. Uh, something's wrong with young people all the time. I don't know how they can listen to that music, and this is me talking. I mean, I haven't listened to any new music that's older than or that's, uh, you know, 1970 or later. So the kind of music even. I now sit down and on comes uh, Stephen Colbert. Here's my three guests tonight. And I've never heard of a single one of them. Okay, another piece of research, Milgram. He did research on what are called serenoids. Let's take a look at that. This is Edmund Rostan. He uh, lived from 1868 to 1918, playwright, playwright, a poet. And uh, Cyrenoids, that term, comes from a play he wrote called Cyrano de Bergerac. Meanwhile, let's note the very nice fashion. Rostan wrote this play, Cyrano de Bergerac, a play that has remained famous over the last 130 years, roughly, that um, it has been in existence. Uh, many people have played Cyrano in movies. Here are three actors who have made movies. The play has been uh, done uh, many times, many places, worldwide. Uh, Cyrano has a physical impediment, kind of, uh, something that uh, makes people wonder about him, and that was an enlarged nose. Now, he has a partner named Christian, very nice-looking, good-looking young man, but he doesn't speak very well. He can't put words together. Uh, he can't think of nice things to say. Cyrano's just the opposite, well-developed, highly social, et cetera. So between the two of them, they make it one decent person. While both men fall in love with Roxanne, who's the main female character, but neither could court her. One can't speak well, the other doesn't look good. So they form a bond, these two men, Cyrano and Christian. Cyrano will give words to Christian that he can speak to Roxanne as he courts her. And they would do it by Christian would stand below her balcony and Cyrano would hide in the bushes. And he would whisper to Christian nice things to say to Roxanne, who's up on the balcony. 
Uh, this kind of partnership then is referred to as a serenoid. 1987 movie starring Steve Martin. Uh, it's called, the title is Roxanne, but it's based on the play Cyrano de Bergerac. Uh, so research. Uh, the participants in this research included what he called a speech uh, shadower. That's a person who speaks the prose. It's not coming from them, it's coming from someone else. Then there's a remote source. That's the person who creates the prose, that's Cyrano. And then there's a naive interactant. That's the person hearing the prose. So the speech sat shadower is Christian in the play. The remote source is Cyrano, who's telling Christian what to say. The naive interactant is Roxanne, who's hearing uh, the prose. Uh, Milgram had people talk to each other in this research. Uh, and one of the two people was in cahoots with Milgram. Uh, and they were told what to say uh, when they were talking to this other person. And Milgram had placed a little microphone in their ear that was not visible. And he would be in another room telling them what to say to the other person. So here you get, uh, there's a naive interactant. Then he talked, he would talk to the naive interactant afterwards, interview with them. What did you think of this person? Nobody ever said, they're, they're a fake. They were faking it. Everybody thought, had comments about this person and what they were saying. Uh, known as a Cyrenaic delusion. You've created a delusion in another person about what someone else was saying. And that person was simply mouthing what someone else was telling them to say. Uh, Milgram went to an elementary school and he had uh, eight to 12 year olds that he'd hook up to this device and they'd go talk to a teacher no teacher ever saw the deception. Remarks would be, this is a really bright kid. I'm just amazed at uh, the quality of his language and the ideas that he had. Uh, Milgram, Milgram's hope for this research was that most people would start to say, there's a lot of self-deception going on in the world and we can't perceive it. And he, his hope was that would eliminate biases, which he saw as self-deceptions. Biases like race, gender, age-based biases. Well, it's an old person. Or what's that 60-year-old uh, doing married to that 35-year-old? Or performance. Uh, uh, this person's really good at thus and such, and they aren't at all, or how educated they are, or how impressed you are with their jobs. These are biases. One of the most common, I, I mean, the most common thing asked in the United States when you meet somebody is, where do you work? We evaluate people economically. I always used to tell my students, anytime you meet somebody, uh, don't ask them about their job. That's establishing a hierarchy. That's how a lot of people feel about it. Uh, ask them if they have a hobby. Uh, do you have a hobby? And uh, most people are excited to talk to you about their hobby, no matter what economic status they have. They're, they're going to be excited about it, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the whole here by Milgram was to eliminate the self-deceptions we have about biases. Race, gender, age, performance, education, and jobs.
Uh, Milgram died age 51, 1984. Uh, never published the results of this piece of research, the serenoid results. Uh, the London School of Economics repeated the research 30 years later in 2014, and uh, they published it. So it's a relatively new piece of uh, information. Uh, people were pretty impressed with this, received a lot of attention. People really liked the idea of it, of a serenoid individual. Uh, Milgram, in the medium, or in the media, and uh, uh, Judy, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to finish this in a few minutes here. Uh, I'll be a bit short of a uh, quarter two. That's fine, JB. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 1975 mil movie that starred William Shatner. This is about uh, 10 years after... Uh, uh, his uh, space TV show was on. Uh, Shatner played Milgram in a movie called The Tenth Level. And uh, Milgram was consulted on the movie and uh, really aided in the making of the movie, but told the producers and the director not to credit him at all. So you don't see his name in the movie, uh, in the movie line of credits. But uh, here's a movie made about Milgram. Uh, 1986 song by this man. This is the same guy uh, uh, at different ages as Peter Gabriel, a uh, famous singer. Uh, we Do What We're Told uh, was the name of the song and it was based on the um, Milgram research. At first, this seems a very negative thing, but I was comforted that someone had the strength to rebel. Uh, uh, Two thousand eight, there was a British TV special called The Heist, and it was a game uh, that people would play on TV. Uh, you would watch people play this game on the TV show. And uh, the game was based on responding to people in a position of authority. In 2010, uh, there was a clothing design firm, a French firm called Enfant Perdu, who uh, released a line of clothing called Milgram. And you can see it looks like metal and like you're strapped in somehow. Uh, 2015 movie uh, about Milgram's research. This is uh, Peter Sarsgaard and Winona Ryder. Uh, it's available on Amazon, but they charge for it uh, $3.99 to watch it. Uh, I found that on uh, Netflix, but you have to pay on Netflix also. It's only free in Canada. And that is the end. So we can go to questions. And uh, I should have been speaking a bit slower. No, no, that's fine. Um, do, do you want to stop sharing your screen, JB? Uh, yes. Let me see here. There's a stop to share. OK. OK. All right. Well, now it's the turn of the audience. I do see that there are some questions in the Q&A line. Uh, but uh, because we did end a little early, we have plenty of time uh, for other questions. Uh, so do be putting those questions in the Q&A line. All right. The first question has to do with the experiment in which the letter was mailed, the six degrees of separation experiment. and. Uh, the question, is, it simply says, what is the percentage of replies to the first letter? Um, and, and maybe I'm meaning, are there some people who just never, you know, uh, who just opted out right from the beginning? Yeah, and I don't know. And I did try to look that up. Uh -huh. And um, I, I think what was done is if a letter 
you know, he sent out 160 letters. If he got 120 responses, he still sent out 160 the second time around. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they didn't have a name on them. You basically were starting over with them. Okay. You know. All right. Next question has to do with the Nielsen ratings. Do you remember the Nielsen ratings? Uh, I guess that was measuring popularity of television programs. Isn't that right? Um, yeah. and, and this questioner says, was the Nielsen ratings, were they part of the 60s and 70s research? Oh, uh, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think Milgram used them. No, I really don't know, but I would guess he did not use them. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, part of the reason people didn't want to use uh, uh, television and researching is because of the percentage of people who owned a TV set, mm -hmm. uh, in the, especially in the 50s. In the 60s, it was starting to get to be a majority, anyway, of people uh, owning TV sets. Um, so it's, uh, you're not getting a broad spectrum a broad enough spectrum of the population. This happened in the 1936 election when a telephone survey was done. Would you vote for Franklin Roosevelt or would you vote for his Republican opponent from Nebraska, from uh, Kansas, Alf Landon? Alf Landon won the survey. Well, he lost the election tremendously, but this is the depression, 1936. People that had a phone gave it up, couldn't afford it anymore. Wealthy people had telephones. Wealthy people were tending to vote Republican. So the research was invalid because not everyone, I mean, a, uh, it was, uh, I don't know that it was a small percentage, but uh, it was not a majority of the population even owned a telephone. So it wasn't a good piece of research. And uh, that's what can happen with Nielsen ratings. Who owned a TV in the 1950s? My family didn't own one till I think about 1956, my dad bought a TV set. Uh, there were neighbors who had them uh, before that, but uh, that kind of research uh, was not being done, uh, you know, for political reasons. Nielsen was doing that kind of research mostly for economics. And uh, we received a little pamphlet. I mean, it was several pages and you would, uh, from Nielsen. Uh, to participate in their program. And uh, I'm, uh, as a kid, I was all excited and writing down everything we'd watch each day, you know, you'd turn the page and it's Tuesday now and you'd write down. And then they also had sections on other things that you do. So I'd go to my parents and I'd say, what's that kind of whiskey you buy? And they go, don't write that down. You know, they were asking what sorts of products do you use in your home and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, uh, you know, a lot of people not saying certain things and, uh, because they thought it might reflect negatively on them. And, okay. uh, yeah, so the, the quality of the research was low. So, no, I'd say Nielsen was not used by academic researchers. Okay, uh, here's a comment, really not a question. This person says the obedience experiment was also carried out at a number of other universities for many, for several years. And in those cases, they did have women subjects, although the person doesn't say whether the results were, were different. Yep. Okay. I, I should, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry, no, no, you go ahead. Did you have something to say? Well, 
I, I, I should have looked some of that up, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and while we're on the obedience experiment, um, and really all of Milgram's work, I, I noticed that it all, each of his experience seemed to hinge on, well, tricking the subjects. Um, and I, I wonder, particularly in the obedience experiments, the people, um, of course, the, they were actors. They weren't people who were actually receiving electric shocks. No one was really in pain. But did the subjects ever, were they ever informed that they had been tricked in any of these experiments? And, and what were their reactions if they did, if they were? Well, I don't know. Uh, they certainly would have found out at the time of publication. If, if, if they, yeah. If they heard about it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, huh, okay. Uh, and then- uh, and I, 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 would, uh, I would doubt it because it would affect other people. You know, they might go out into the waiting room and say, hey, it's a fake. <laughs> yeah okay um was the work done the next question was the work done by the milgram foundation uh no excuse me was the work done by milgram foundational for, for work done by tversky and kahneman in behavioral economics this person says i've read books about the work of tversky and kahneman and it seems somewhat similar although in the context of economics and market behavior is that something you can speak to? No, I, I'm not familiar with that work. I'm okay. Sorry. That, that might be something I think I know a little, I've heard about it. Maybe it's something to look up for next time. Um, sure. All right, next question. So we'll move on from that. Next question. I don't know if this has to do with the, there, there is a play called Six Degrees of Separation. Uh, this questioner wants to know, did Milgram want to be a playwright? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. No. I don't know if the questioner is referring to that play, but certainly that yeah. build on, on the ideas, but I don't think Milgram was involved. All right. Well, we do have time for, uh, um, oh, here we go. Here's another question. Um, Nielsen ratings were used to set advertising rates, uh, says this person. That was the purpose of them. I guess the more people watched, the higher the, they could charge for ads. Um, yeah. But here's another question. Uh, so, this person says, psychologists have been studying unconscious bias for a long time, and we're still resisting. <laughs> yeah, uh, does education make a difference? Does knowledge uh -huh. make a difference? Uh, does knowing what we're doing and having it pointed out to us make a difference? I would say, no, it doesn't. We want to st we want to stick with our belief. And I, I wrote an article back in the 1970s where I said um, uh, nothing is defended more aggressively than or we defend most aggressively those assumptions which are least provable. Hmm. That deals with religion. It deals with biases deals with some other stuff. So the ability of people to change, I think, is pretty minimal. Okay. It happens. Right. Mm -hmm. We do have a few more questions, a few more minutes, and there it certainly is time for more questions. So if you have a question for JB, type it in the Q&A line. While we're waiting for another question to come in, um, I would like to know, um, we, as a society, uh, we are much more suspicious of authority nowadays than we were back in the early 60s when the Milgram obedience experiment was performed. Has the obedience test have ever been repeated in more recent times? And has the outcome been different? Would it, no. would it be the I'll same if we did it today? The big study was done by Microsoft, and that's recent. Mm -hmm. It's in this, you know, it's within the last 15 years and uh, it showed the same results. Really? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it was 6.6 .6 degrees of separation, the Microsoft research was. But what oh, about the obedience? Oh, the obedience, yeah. No, uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I was thinking the wrong thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I don't know about uh, more research on obedience and there may be a reluctance to repeat. Uh, it has been repeated, but uh, mm -hmm. there may be a reluctance to, to do a big study on it because of the uh, so many people believe it to be unethical or immoral or, but no, there have been many, there have been several obedience studies done. Um, this person, this is more of a comment. Uh, unfortunately, this person says the obedience study reveals that very few of us are strong enough to disobey an order. The atrocities will continue. Yeah, um, that, that, I think that's what the obedience study shows is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, beware, yeah, beware of doing anything in a position of authority. Another interesting piece of research that was done was uh, uh, researchers went to uh, a person's place of work and talked to them about their values and what would you do here at work? And I'll do anything these people want me to do. I'm here to promote this company and so on and so forth. Then six months later, I, and they asked them all sorts of questions. Who's, your, who's in your family? How many children? Where do you live? You know, that kind of stuff. Then six months later, a different group of researchers went out and talked to these people as they were exiting church service and got quite a different set of answers <laughs> about uh, issues of morality. So where you're at can make a difference the environment. Some people behave in this particular way at this particular place, but quite differently in another place. Uh, okay, uh, next uh, comment comes, or question comes in. Hi, JB, I am involved in a board that suggests an intercultural development inventory. Uh, would this be one of those areas that the level of success in creating change would be minimal? I, I, I think what this means uh, yeah. is creating such an inventory, would that create change or, or would the change be minimal? Well, there's no, there's no question that uh, there are people who change, mm -hmm. but uh, it's pretty low and the success rate is low. Alcoholics Anonymous, for instance, has never allowed research on its participants, long-term research. But um, it's estimated that about eight to 12% of all people in Alcoholics Anonymous maintain it for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's pretty small, that's a pretty small number. Okay. And uh, weight, weight loss, I think, is at about 3% of all people maintain weight loss. Mm -hmm. Very, very small percentage. So a lot of groups where people um, are involved in changing lifestyle type issues just uh, doesn't, seem to, doesn't seem to work. And a question here, I'm not sure <clears throat> you know the answer to this, but it's a good question. How many people believe what their choice of media tells them? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I saw an interesting uh, article. This was many years ago. And I don't remember the percentages, but it was a phenomenal amount of people who the only news they get is late night talk shows. Yeah. You know, and, and that day it was Johnny Carson and David Letterman and, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say about sources. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, um, uh, you know, you watch local television and you get 30 seconds to two minutes. 
Uh, I watched mm -hmm. some national, uh, you know, some all day news stations. And sometimes you get a panel of people and they discuss something for 15 minutes. Uh, and that's quite a difference. The next question then becomes, uh, how long can you hold people's attention for these discussions, generally speaking? Um, so. And going back to um, today's uh, lecture, uh, why did you start a series on the history of psychology with Stanley Milgram? Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, I've written up 14 of these psychologists. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a set of three lectures on Freud that I'll be doing over the next three weeks. So they're not all this short. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there I, something I want to guess that, uh, you know, this is such interesting stuff mm -hmm. is probably why I started with it. It's the same thing with um, when I when I started teaching presidents, I started with Lincoln. He wasn't the first president. <laughs> you know, once I did Lincoln, I basically went to Washington and have gone straight through, did Lincoln again as I was going through, did it chronologically. But um, everybody's heard of Lincoln and there's lots of interesting things about Lincoln that people didn't know. And so I think I probably picked it because it um, has some controversy to it and mm -hmm. it's interesting and able to show that Milgram was doing things other than obedience research. That lost letter thing I found very interesting. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, it, might say, it might say something about me. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, on that note, I think we're just about out of time here. So uh, we are going to uh, say goodbye for today. I want to thank um, J.B. Anderson. I want to thank uh, Grayson, who is in the background, making everything happen electronically. I really want to thank the audience for all of your uh, comments and questions. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone back next week when the topic will be Sigmund Freud, the first of three parts, Sigmund Freud's influences and his early works. I but also, I, I'd like to make a final comment. I sure. have uh, I have a mailing that I put out. There's about 300 people on the list. I include a lecture outline. You can write to me at jb1717 at comcast.net. And I'll add you to the mailing list if you're not on it. And you can receive these lecture outlines in advance. Okay, very good, everyone. Thank Thanks. you so much. And we'll see you next time.